Academic, author, historian R.W. Johnson has been writing a great deal recently about concerns over the Russian presence uh, in South Africa and Africa generally. Uh, his most recent contribution to Biz News was on the Wagner Group. We're going to talk about that, but wow, this being uh, in the aftermath of that shock news that came out yesterday of the Americans accusing South Africa of supplying arms to Russia. We'll find out the relevance of that too. We couldn't have timed this conversation any better, Mr. Johnson, uh, after yesterday's news. Maybe you can put it in perspective. When an ambassador of a country like the United States makes a statement that it uh, that he did, uh, saying that South Africa sold arms to Russia, uh, and they're pretty convinced about it, were his exact words, would they have absolute proof before doing that, or could it just be uh, flying a kite? Uh, well, two things. First of all, he wouldn't have made that statement without the go-ahead from the State Department. Uh, so the idea that he is somehow uh, operating as a sort of lone wolf is is not on. Uh, secondly, uh, of course, they look. The fact is that American intelligence does operate within South Africa, uh, and that uh, they've always had people here from CIA. And I'm sure they still do. Now, obviously, this is a sensitive point because they probably don't want to reveal much about that, which is why, of course, South Africa is demanding the evidence because they hope that that will force them to reveal that sort of thing. All I can say is that about, must be about 15 years ago now, when I was writing for the London Sunday Times, there was a story I was chasing about uh, what had happened to the people and uh, their work from the Vota Basson uh, Biochemical Warfare Laboratory. And I tracked them all down. They, they were mainly living in Pretoria. And to my horror, some of them actually had flasks full of toxins sitting in their garages, enough to wipe out the entire city. Um, and... Uh, but when I went round these people, one to the other, they had all been visited by people from American intelligence who had all said, look, this is what's got to happen. This is absolutely intolerable situation where you guys have got this. And they had been the ones to, and they took no nonsense. I mean, they made them comply with what they wanted. And uh, they had jumped on this very, very hard. And I said, what about the South African police? What about the other? Oh, no, we've never heard a word from them. So, I mean, it was interesting that right under the nose of the government in Pretoria, that American intelligence is operating very vigorously uh, in that respect. And I, I suspect, you know, when I heard this story, I thought, well, I'm sure they've got people on the ground who are with very good sources, and they wouldn't say this unless they were very confident of it. I see that now they've also said that the Admiral Gorshkov, the Russian warship that came out for the exercises, that that was also loaded with arms here. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, obviously very serious too. And look, I think that South Africa's response is preposterous, saying that we need to uh, set up an independent inquiry with a retired judge. I mean, for heaven's sake, this is now six months ago that the Lady R was here, and it's several months since those exercises in the Admiral Gorshkov. At the time when uh, the Lady R was here, people asked Tandi Madise, the Defence Minister, what was going on, what was being loaded onto it, what was being taken off. And she said, well, I can't be certain about that until I get all the full documentation and then I'll know. But after that, she said nothing. Now, this is six months on. What on earth is this pretension by the government? I mean, after all, this is their country. This is what country they run, not the Americans. It's amazing that they turn around and say, well, what is your evidence? 
I mean, for heaven's sake, do they not know what's going on in their own country, even six months after it's happened, and where the defense minister said she would get the full documentation? I mean, this is just time-wasting and trying to kick for touch because they don't know what to do. Uh, and I doubt whether the Americans have got any patience with this, and I suspect that may be a motive for why the ambassador spoke out so firmly. Uh, because uh, they've obviously been trying to play them along, and the Americans, uh, I, I suspect, are fed up with this. But um, I, I, I find it preposterous, and this won't get them off the hook, you know. Um, uh, as the, the, I mean, the ambassador said yesterday he bet his life on it, which means that, you know, he's been utterly convinced by the evidence he's seen. So, um, you know, this won't do. But it's Ramaphosa's way, of course, of trying to put off having to take decisions and so forth. We're very used to this. But I think he's playing in the wrong league. This is the big league. You know, that's all very well when you're trying to deflect John Steenhazen or uh, some local journalists or whatever, and you don't want to make up your mind immediately, and so you set up a commission or a committee or whatever. That's just time-wasting in order to, to do that. But for heaven's sake, this is big stuff. You're talking now to the superpower, and you're talking to someone uh, with whom our trade relations are absolutely vital. I mean, you can't mess around like this. It's extraordinary. How important is it, and um, from from the if you take the sweep of history, with from the outside when you look at an event like this, it appears as though South Africa is arming. Russia, which invaded Ukraine and is effectively killing Ukrainians by its actions. But that's a very first-level thinking approach of it. How, how important, what could the consequences of, of an action like this be, given that, uh, or if we were to believe that the American evidence is going to confirm uh, what actually happened? Well, uh, look, I think that the first point, really, is that, you know, Russia is clearly very, very short of war material. Uh, that is, is clear. I mean, they've actually been using T-34 tanks, which are of Second World War tanks, uh, which, uh, my God, I mean, that's absolutely amazing. But and, and they've been scrounging what they can get from Iran and North Korea. Those are the only other two countries that have been supplying them with arms. Both of them international lepers, both of them under sanctions from the U U.S. Uh, so that's the company that we would appear to be in. Uh, look, I mean, the point really is that, you know, the Americans and the Europeans have, since the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, made it clear that they're taking sanctions against Russia or those who give them uh, aid. They're trying to prevent this sort of thing happening. And if South Africa has done this, they've done it in full knowledge that this was uh, the risk they were running. Uh, how they could imagine they could get away with this, I do not know. I, I don't think they realize, as I say, that they're, they're playing in the big league now. And uh, that, um, you know, trying to pull the wool over John Steenhazen's eyes is one thing, but not over, over the Americans. And I think that... Um, and you know, it's very, very serious, and you know the complicated, you know the 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 uh, likely outcomes for Ogoa, and uh, remember that we are still our entire program for dealing with people with AIDS depends on American generosity. Uh, I mean, that's just American aid given with no quid pro quo, just as a, a generous gesture, uh, and it's been going on for years. I mean, quite. Well, how they can expect that to continue is another good question, you know. But uh, we shall see. The consequences could be dire. Would they affect South African, the South African economy and, by definition, the creation of jobs here? Oh, yes. Oh, look. Uh, first of all, remember two things about AGOA. It was actually for less developed countries, and South Africa as a middle developing country it was a special favor that we were allowed in. It wasn't really for countries as developed as this. So there was that. Secondly, 
there's a clause, as the ambassador pointed out, in the AGOA uh, treaty itself, which says that this is an agreement between partners who agree that they will not act against the national security interests of the United States. So, I mean, that's already in there. They don't have to bring out anything new. You know, they could just say, you, you've broken the agreement. But uh, look, a lot of the cars we make in the Eastern Cape and Durban and Pretoria are exported to the United States. And an awful lot of the, the rest of them go to Europe. Now, what no one is saying, but which ought to be considered, is that what has tended to happen in these matters, for example, with the, uh, the Huawei, the, the American, the, the Chinese telephone company, is that the Americans took strong measures against them and then rather more reluctantly and a bit more slowly, all the European countries followed. So if America takes action over Goa, for example, it's only too likely that European countries will follow along because the EU is taking the same attitude on Ukraine uh, as the Americans. So that would put at risk almost the entire output of our car industry. And it would threaten several hundred thousand jobs. It's about 8% of the economy. Uh, and might close it down. Those companies might just all leave. So... Uh, you know, this is, is pregnant with, I mean, if I were in Castatio, I'd be jumping up and down at the government putting all these jobs at risk, uh, which is what they're doing. I mean, it's, it's because, I mean, they haven't denied it, you know, they've said, oh, we have to find out, but, you know, at our leisure with some, get some judge out of retirement and, you know, heart oh, Lord. I mean, this need this is urgent. This needs to be answered right away. If they have been doing it, then they must know what the truth is. Uh, they'd better own up right away if they have, and if they have, they better be able to say, absolutely not, this is completely untrue. But they don't even do that. So, you know, I, I think we're heading for serious trouble here. And I said at the beginning of this discussion that it was beautifully timed because your piece... Uh, that's on Biz News, in, uh, well, published last week on Biz News, on the Wagner Group, was opened a lot of eyes. Certainly opened my eyes to the way that the Russians and its proxy, this uh, mercenary group, is operating in Africa, is also got to be surely very, very concerning uh, to the South African government and to the rest of the world. I mean, the ANC has always been very vocal about mercenaries drawn essentially from Western countries in the Congo and elsewhere. But this is a more brutal uh, and more rapacious mercenary group than anything we've seen before. And the ANC has not said a word about it, uh, which is very, very strange. Uh, one of the things I pointed out in that article is that the Illusion 76, which came out more recently, now the Americans have not yet talked about this. Well, I suspect that's coming, uh, because that too was a very strange visit, and it looks like something funny was going on there as well. Now that came from the base in America, Chavlovsky uh, base, sorry, the base in Russia, which is used by Wagner as its headquarters for all its logistics. So, you know, already there's a connection there, which uh, is 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 very interesting and odd. And the government really needs to talk about that. Um, I mean, the, again, this preposterous excuse that the airplane was delivering diplomatic mail. I mean, that would have fooled a, a schoolboy. I mean, it's absurd. The, the Russian embassy has been in Pretoria since 1992. The first thing an embassy has to do is to set up arrangements to receive and send diplomatic mail. That's now been operating for 31 years. Why is there suddenly a need for a huge military transport plane uh, to fly all the way from Russia to deliver diplomatic mail? I mean, can't. This is just not believable. And, and they really could have come up with something better than that. But uh, And that, that plane was delivering stuff all over Africa, which must, in many cases, have been for Wagner, because that's the only Russian forces which need military supplies 
uh, which is operating on the continent. The Wagner Group is also very involved in the Ukraine war. Mr. Johnson, if you step back and uh, give us your thesis uh, on what is going on here or what could be going on here uh, on the balance of evidence, what would that be? Well, I'm very much uh, influenced by what happened yesterday. Uh, I, I, I mean, I have to take very seriously what the American ambassador said because, you know, I. I'm absolutely sure he wouldn't have made that statement in the way that he did unless he was very sure of his ground. I didn't think this could be happening, to be quite frank, because I thought about it and I thought, that surely Pretoria wouldn't be that silly, wouldn't be that stupid to put at risk so much. Uh, because, you know, the fact is that our army and its resources are relatively puny. Uh, we don't have a lot to offer. But, of course, the Russians are very, very hard up. They're running out of all sorts of things, and they seem to be desperate for reinforcement. Prigozhin, the Wagner <coughs> commander, as we know, has been threatening to withdraw his troops from Bakhmut, saying that they can't get ammunition. So there's clearly a big shortage of ammunition. So... But I, again, I'm surprised because, you know, we, the SANDF does not use Russian armaments. So I don't know what it is that we use and we have as ammunition, which is compatible with Russian uh, armor. Uh, but presumably there is something. Otherwise, uh, that couldn't happen. But uh, if this has happened, it's a measure not only of how foolish uh, the government is being, and how ideological, but it's also a tremendous measure on how hard up the Russians on now are for war material. So what happens from here? What is the likely development? Well, we're all supposed to wait for this judge to be hauled out of retirement and to take his time as he looks at the case and call I mean, this could go on for a long time. Uh, but I don't think that the Americans are prepared to wait uh, for this nonsense. Uh, they know that's a charade. And uh, there will be cynicism and skepticism about the judge, too, as to you know how much anyone can trust someone that, in effect, has been chosen by the government. But uh, the government is obviously fumbling. I mean, look, the ambassador gave his talk and the government did not react right away. There were several hours before Ramaphosa appeared in Parliament, and even then he was sort of desperately treading water. It's clear that the, the, the reaction to this was one of consternation and not knowing what to do. And I suspect that that is still the situation, uh, that they're running around uh, saying, how do we deal with this? And it's a bit like, you know, the situation with electricity or the situation over Putin and the ICC, that actually the options are limited and that just saying, oh dear, oh dear, doesn't get you very far. Uh, that, you know, you're going to have to make some tough choices one way or the other. And uh, I have no doubt that Pretoria is talking to Moscow absolutely 20 to the dozen at the moment, seeking advice and wondering what to do, although they're the worst people to get advice from on this sort of thing because they're, they're not masters of diplomatic finesse. But uh, there we are. Now, look, I, I think that the government doesn't know what to do and it, it's playing for time, but this isn't... I don't think it's going to work. The fact that the ambassador came out publicly in the way he did is a sign of their discontent with the sort of high-level conversation they'd apparently been having about this. This wasn't going anywhere. The government was obviously uh, not coming clean on anything. And so the Americans have forced it into the public arena, and they could do that again. Might this have an impact on the 2024 election? As we know, it's, uh, it, it's potentially a watershed. We already know the ANC is likely to get below 50%. Would something like this resonate with the voting public? Uh, some of it, but um, 
I don't suppose it's anything like as influential as electricity and power cuts, but um, or water cuts, for that matter. But I, I think that, um, look, it's more the indirect effect. I think that the business community will be going berserk about this. They know that their livelihoods, their companies are being put at risk by decisions of this sort. They've warned publicly over and over again that this is dangerous and you shouldn't be thinking of, of behaving in this way. And I'm sure that most of them will be absolutely horrified by uh, what came out yesterday. And it will already be affecting investment decisions and probably personal decisions about whether or not to live here. Uh, so that, you know, it, it will have already done a great deal of damage. And I do think also that, you know, it's difficult to imagine many companies contributing to the ANC's election fund, uh, given this, because this is such a, a disastrous issue for the business community uh, that, um, well, I mean, who knows what they'll do, but... You know, I, I think that it will affect all of those things. And, of course, what we don't know is how far... Uh, I mean, the reports are that the Russians were paying for the ANC's municipal election campaign in 2016 already. Uh, but apparently as a quid pro quo, hoping to get Zuma to sign on for nuclear power stations. So, you know, uh, we know that Russian money is coming into the ANC and helping to pay salaries there right now. Uh, but, you know, presumably they will look to Russia for further support, uh, the government, in this situation. Mr. Johnson, just as a, as a parting shot, as it were, what's going on in Ukraine right now? Um, I guess is, well, we don't know if it's going to be settled in the next few months, but as the northern summer comes through, the two sides will uh, get, go at each other again. If the Russians were to lose in Ukraine, if they were to be kicked back, and the fact that they don't seem to have, they have to come to South Africa to ask for ammunition would suggest that that has to be a risk. What might the consequence of that be on a geopolitical scale? Well, look, I think you've got to think about what sort of counteroffensive the uh, Ukrainians are likely to mount. I think the key is that the Russians have established a so-called land bridge all the way down to the Crimea, more or less connecting the Crimea by land now to Russia. And the Ukrainians will want to break that. So they won't be launching a counteroffensive at Bakhmut. It'll be much more likely to be somewhere near Crimea and the objective will be to break right through the Russian lines and get to the coast, somewhere like Kursov. And that's why the Russians have been reinforcing their defenses along that. Uh, so that would be what, if they managed to do that, that would, of course, threaten the Crimea as well. And uh, I think that there are a lot of people, certainly in Europe, possibly elsewhere, who think that if they manage to achieve that, and to throw the Russians back quite sharply, at least in that part of the, the uh, battlefield, that that might produce a sort of situation in which you could come to some sort of truce, peace agreement, uh, because on that basis you could get a more favorable settler. Uh, I don't know that that's how the Ukrainians see it, because that would still leave the Russians in possession of the Donbass. But... Uh, nonetheless, that's more or less what, what, what I think we should be expecting. And the news yesterday that the British are supplying Ukrainians with cruise missiles, heavy, big cruise missiles. I mean, they sound like two million pounds a shot, those missiles, uh, and they're huge things. Now, the Brits say that those are not for use outside of Ukraine. They have to be used on the battlefield. So I assume they will be used precisely uh, against Russian defenses uh, in order to aid that. Uh, and they'll be blockbusters, you know, there's no doubt about it. And you shoot those things along towards where they've got their pillboxes and their defenses, it'll create havoc. And 
So, I mean, you know, I think that they are arming for something like that, and they're going to have modern tanks. They're going to outclass the Russians, not in the numbers of what they've got, but in the quality and the high-tech weaponry they're going to have available. And here we are in South Africa supporting the side that's on the back foot or may be on the back foot into the future. R.W. Johnson, historian, writer, academic. It's always a privilege talking with you. Thank you for your insights today. And I'm Alec Hogg from Business News.com.